there's a neighborhood in Winston-Salem that once personified the American dream, a neighborhood that reflected a cross-section of America, from factory workers to professionals to tradesmen, a neighborhood where, with hard work, people were able to buy a home and raise their families, a neighborhood where the residents celebrated each other's triumphs and shared each other's grief. A neighborhood where parents rejoiced in seeing their children go to college and enjoy a better life than they did. It's easy to get there. East of US 52, head out New Walker Town Road of short ways, make a left at Cameron Avenue, and you're there. Later, generations of children who grew up here knew it only as a great place to live, but their parents had a name for it. They called it Reynolds Town. World War I, the war to end all wars was over. The United States, spared the destruction on the continent, was about to embark on a decade-long party that would come to be known as the Roaring Twenties. America's love affair with baseball was in full swing. In New York, the Phillies beat the Giants 4-3 in the first Major League Baseball game ever to be played on a Sunday. In North Carolina, the state government was about to start on an extensive road-building program that would give the state a new nickname, the Good Road State. Winston-Salem was the undisputed manufacturing center of North Carolina and the largest city in the state. Much of Winston-Salem's growth was due to the city's sizable population of African Americans, many of whom came to work for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. Reynolds had a reputation for benevolence toward its employees. 1919 would be the year that Reynolds would break ground for an extensive housing development for employees at what was then the eastern edge of the city limits. Although officially known as Cameron Park, it soon became known as Reynolds Town. Reynolds Town was developed by the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, and they bought a farm from the Cameron family. And they bought some other tracks, too, and they put them together to build houses for their employees. Reynolds built the community primarily for its white employees. However, there's some evidence that they built a section nearby for their African-American employees also. But what we know today as Reynolds Town essentially started out as a white community. They built something between 130 and 180 houses with the idea that they would eventually sell them back to the employees. They leased them at about 6% interest and a portion of the rent went towards the future purchase of the home that the employee uh, lived in. So their employees would eventually become homeowners. Now the interesting thing is, is that R.J. Reynolds himself was actually involved with the planning for the neighborhood and how the terms were to be developed. Reynolds died before construction started, but the company pressed forward, retaining the bungalow style of architecture that Reynolds so favored that he used it for Renolda House, his mansion outside town. The bungalow style lent itself very well to the South, so it caught on very quickly. One of the reasons it worked in the South was a porch was a major part of it, as I said, often an integral part, and uh, I don't think people realize today or remember how much a porch was a, a not just another room of the house, but, but really a major room, and, and in, in three seasons out of the year, it was, it, it was one of the major rooms of the house, and in the back you had a porch where a lot of things like, you know, selling beans and all went on. I mean, the porches were, were very much used, and in this climate, that mattered a lot. <laughs> They were pre-cut houses, and, and, and it was a novelty. They just go down and see what they're doing to the houses. And so we take a little walk and come down and look at the house. That, that was all we needed, and go on back, see. People began living in it right away, and um, it was a solidly white neighborhood from, you know, 19, 19 20, 21, when they were built, um, right on through. And in, in, in 1930 and 31, uh, Atkins High School was built. It was a 
a major, large, and very modern and very well-equipped uh, high school for blacks in this community. That was built on Cameron Street, just north of 12th. That was the only high school for blacks in the city, and in the city limits. And so you had the crowds of black children walking through this white neighborhood uh, to go to school every morning and come home each day. We forget today how every child, black and white, walked to school back then. So when you lived in a neighborhood near a high school, you had these teenagers walking through your neighborhood to school. Lots of people did not particularly care to see crowds of teenagers walking through their neighborhood once, twice a day. And if you were a white resident and it was a crowd of black teenagers, you were somewhat wary and you particularly did not want to see this take place. What happened is that as soon as that school opened, the neighborhood, um, and this is something almost unique to Winston-Salem, the neighborhood switched almost immediately from being a white neighborhood to being a black neighborhood. The whites all moved out. Uh, there's some interesting documentation. There was one, in one year, it switched completely from being all white residents to being all black residents. When the house was bought, they, were, they had uh, running water, indoor bath, and bathtubs and so forth. This was pretty modern for that area. You could go, what, four or five blocks on the other side of Reynoldstown, and it was, it was just no housing. It, it was awful. And um, with the no outside plumbing, if any plumbing, and uh, no hot, no no running water, maybe or able to stick it out in the back. And you look back at what else was available, housing that was available for, for working class blacks. I consider Reynolds to be on a very high Reynolds town to be on a very high level. In the beginning, every house had a lot between it. So there was never a house right next to each other. And back in those days, by having this empty lot, people used that empty lot to grow their garden. And everybody had a garden. Right before World War II, which was about in 1940, they began selling these lots that were between the houses. The Ferro Company handled this, this, these sales. And incidentally, those lots cost about $50, I, I think. <laughs> about $50. And some people bought them who lived next to them. And then Ferro Company bought the most of them. And they erected, erected houses on them. The one that's directly across the street there, that's the Reynolds house. All right, if you look north there, that is not a house that belonged to Richard J. Reynolds. That house was built. All right, if you, if you continue to look north, the house, the green one, uh, that's a Reynolds house. Okay, the house next door, you can tell it's just something about it that, uh, that is not a Reynolds house. What you'll see now is a pattern, and I'm making it simplistic, but you'll see a 1920 house, a 1940 house, a 1920 house, a 1940 house, a 1920 house. And it, it's a fascinating story of the, of the development of the neighborhood. Everybody was a neighbor. You didn't have to knock your doors unless you just wanted to. But they were just all neighbors and they would all come. We enjoyed each other. I remember at Christmas time, Mama used to put up a big Christmas tree, and the neighbors would all come, and we'd have this sing along and give out presents and all like that. It was a, a nice place to be. Uh, everybody knew everybody, even if it wasn't on the same street. They knew the families, and all the kids knew each other. You either talk with your neighbor uh, on camera, or you talk with your neighbor if you were in the back on Rich Avenue. So you really got to know each other. From one generation to the next generation. We knew all of the neighbors on the street. We knew their children. We knew the grandchildren. Grandchildren would come and visit grandparents, um, maybe once or twice a year, some more often. But we knew them, and they would be embraced uh, as part of the neighborhood. And um, you would just have a, a great sense of belonging. Right down there at the bottom of the hill, 
between right at 8th Street and Rich, R.J. Reynolds had their trace dump. Trace power. Yeah. Yeah, right. All the waste from everywhere they had right. was dumped down there. <laughs> we had, we would go down there, we used to make little old riding carts. <laughs> We'd go down there, they had these big iron wheels they used to use on some of the carts on those wooden floors in the factories, and then when they finished them, they just dumped them. And we'd go down there and get these big iron wheels and pieces of wood, pull out old nails, and we would make up these little carts with these iron wheels on them. We used to call those go-karts. And you'd get those wheels and make those carts. And uh, they could make them, and I mean, you could ride them, too. We <laughs> had to pave sidewalks at that time. And we'd get up here at the top of this hill and get on those things when we didn't get killed. <laughs> But they would just kind of nail together and wouldn't we? We'd scoot all the way down to the bottom of the hill. Just ride those things. Many of the children were what we call latchkey children now. But parents didn't really worry about that too much because Ms. Adams was always on the job. She would be on her porch, you could see her. But uh, sometimes she would be in her living room peeping out of the blinds, and you thought you were getting away with stuff. <laughs> and next thing you know, as soon as your parents got home, you were getting a spanking. At that time, pretty much everybody worked at Reynolds. And just about all the employees rode the bus to work, those that didn't walk. So about the same time every morning, you would see everybody leaving to go get the bus, and about the same times in the afternoon you'd see everybody coming back. People said everything they had. I had a garden back then. Mr. Adams had a garden and he grew some of everything back there in my garden and we gave it away and used what we wanted. Roy was talking about Miss Reynolds down here. They had a cherry tree that had big yellow, yellow cherries on it and they had no children. And but you know, like a lot of houses, it was a family of sisters. Right. And all of them worked at R.J. Reynolds. So when the cherries <laughs> got ripe, they would call us and tell everybody, you know, come on, pick cherries. It was a very friendly neighbor. Kept each other. They, what they had, they said. Every street in Reynolds Town, um, Jackson Avenue, Graham, Gray, um, Rich, Camel, and I'm not sure about Cameron, but I think Cameron did. They all had a neighborhood club. Graham Avenue had the Love Thy Neighbor Club, uh, the Cameron Avenue Flower Club. That's where all of the people get together and they do projects for the street as well as for the community. There's a benevolence group in case of illness or, or death. They are the ones who keep everybody informed. In case anyone um, had any sickness or death in the family, they in turns would fix food and carry it to the home, and they would do all sorts of things like that. They had, they didn't have a need for wanting anything because the neighbors would make sure they had food and they would have money for whatever their needs were. If a family couldn't afford for all of their children to go on the bus trip that we were going on as a community, all children went. Someone paid for them, or groups of people paid for them. It wasn't even asked, it wasn't discussed, it wasn't a big deal, you know, it happened. There was never a day when you had a school play or performance that the whole neighborhood didn't turn out. Certainly if your child was involved, or even the neighbor's children involved, and you would walk up to the high school. If you were interested in them and some of the things that they, they were doing, or planned to do one way or the other and you just felt like it was the thing to do. If one of the kids was in it, everybody went to see it and celebrate that. Um, that's always, that's a little different sense of community, but it was wonderful. It's uh, interesting to recognize the number of college graduates that have come out of this community. Winston-Salem State University is responsible for a lot of that being here and being available. So communities were segregated, but the benefit of that for African Americans was that we lived together regardless of occupation or career track. 
Uh, so we had doctors uh, as next door neighbors to tobacco workers. We had ministers, we had teachers, um, we had business owners. Uh, and they were all there to nurture the young people and to encourage. Every other house, I'm talking about, you either had a high school principal, or you had a dentist, or you had a doctor. Uh, and this was, let's say, from Cameron all the way up to 14th Street. If you wanted to be a doctor, you all you had to do is see Dr. Malloy, and you would get your instructions from him. And next door to us was a teacher. She taught school. I would go into her home, and it wasn't uncommon for um, Mama Vinson, who had not, uh, who was a stay-at-home grandma, uh, to say, well, what were your grades like? Let me see that report card, you know, and, okay, you could do better in this. You could do better in that. It was instilling us through church and through our school, parents and school, that the greatest thing we could do is complete a college education. My friends and the young people who are older than me went on to college. It was uh, not, can you go to college? You're going. Some kind of way you will go, and some kind of way it will work out for you, and you will be better than we could be. The levels of success, everybody didn't become professionals, but everybody pretty much had the idea that this is what, you, what life was all about. You worked, and you achieved whatever level that you could, and then when you reach that level, you know, you, you, you instill that in your kids to move on. We had such good neighbors. We had excellent neighbors. And we didn't, we thought we would, they would be here forever, and so would we. Now they've all gone. <laughs> We're left, I'm left here alone, more or less. The cellars are around the corner, they're my good neighbors. But other than that, most of our original neighbors have, have passed on. I came back um, to Winston I, to live because I, at that point I came back, I had two children. And I really wanted them to have a sense of community, a sense of neighborhood, uh, a sense of what I had had growing up. Uh, regrettably, the neighborhoods had changed. The older residents, you know, were up in age. They went into bad health, and died. And therefore the house went to the heirs, or was sold, or rented. And so you didn't have people necessarily living in these houses that were homeowners. The streets had changed. The quality of the care for the homes had changed. Um, the yards weren't as well maintained. Uh, but that's what happens when the community transitions from primarily homeowner to uh, renters or absentee landlords. When we in Housing and Neighborhood Services became aware of the problems in the Reynoldstown area, we increased our code enforcement and housing rehab efforts significantly. We had staff attend a meeting of the In Touch Neighborhood Association and announced that they would be in the area periodically taking applications for rehab assistance because we do have a number of products that's designed to repair houses and we felt that the neighborhood needed to be aware of those programs in order to actively participate. The Reynoldstown area is a very important part of the African American history in Winston-Salem. And having discovered these problems, we could not sit idly by and ignore these problems because the area is so rich in history and there is a need to preserve that area for future prosperity. One of the things we discovered was that there were residents that were moving back to this area, and we found that very encouraging. People who grew up in our area, which we are designating as Reynolds Town, have a real fondness of their neighborhood. Um, they oftentimes go away and come back to visit. Uh, we have on almost every street, there's been one or two homeowners or young people who grew up, gone on, retired, and have come back to live in the home because of the memories they have. 
individuals who know about Reynoldstown come in and buy houses so that they can say they lived in Reynoldstown because of the history that's here. Why do people come back? Uh, because there is a sense of security that still exists. There's a spirit on these streets of comfort, of serenity, of security, of peace, of belonging, and you can get to know your neighbors that you don't have in other cities. Beyond what our department can do, the Reynolds Town area can receive a higher level of protection by being designated as the historic district, and that process has been investigated by the city county planning department. If the neighborhood is listed on the National Register, it does bring with it certain benefits. I think first and foremost, it's important to say that listing on the National Register is, is a great honor. Not just any old building or any old neighborhood can be listed on the National Register. There are investment tax credits that are available for property owners who own property in National Register historic districts who want to do a comprehensive rehabilitation of their home. Thirdly, National Register listing is going to provide a measure of protection for the neighborhood from any projects, for instance, that are federally or state financed that may have a negative impact on that neighborhood, be it a housing program, be it uh, a highway, whatever, that sort of thing. The National Register status is going to ensure that the neighborhood remains intact and keeps its historic integrity. We think Reynoldstown is a good candidate for the National Register because it is so distinct. It embodies the history of Winston-Salem. It happened because of R.J. Reynolds. There is the original architecture and the second shift of houses built in the 1940s. It was a white neighborhood, and then it shows the influence of Atkins and the success of the African-American population that enabled it to become a black neighborhood. We need to preserve something of the African-American experience in Winston-Salem. Uh, so much of our history, which was so wonderfully rich uh, and vibrant, has not been preserved with physical buildings. There initially were several neighborhoods in Winston-Salem for African Americans and that African Americans initially lived, uh, lived in. East 14th Street, the Depot Street neighborhood, and Columbian Heights were all neighborhoods developed for and lived in by African Americans. And unfortunately, through the years, um, either through highway projects or the urban renewal of, of the 1950s and 60s, um, these neighborhoods essentially are no more. The other uh, sort of identifiable African-American neighborhoods in Winston-Salem, the ones that you could, you could draw a circle around on a map and say this is a neighborhood, um, almost without, without exception, they're all gone. As with most cases with our older neighborhoods, over time you are going to see a certain amount of deterioration to the housing fabric. However, from a preservation standpoint, this can be a very good thing because you have a lot of original architectural detailing remaining from the period, and, and this is the case with Reynoldstown. It certainly is a very well-maintained neighborhood, and the housing stock, for the most part, is intact, and that's in large part why it is still eligible for the National Register because the architectural integrity of the neighborhood as a whole is, is still remaining. If you drive around there, there, you see the same plan used more than once, you'll see the same house. And what's, what's fun, you'll have two houses that were, were basically the same when they were built. And today, one of them has, has retained most of its original features, and another one will have had its, um, his, its posts replaced, uh, maybe with what I call New Orleans, the, the metal cast iron. Um, and it'll be covered with vinyl siding and the false knee braces on the side will have been removed and you get a photograph or a slide of that and then you show the other one and you show what, you know, what it was or the way I use it is what it could be again. The Reynoldstown area is probably the last real section 
of East Winston with its original um, buildings, the original structures, the streets in its uh, original patterns. Um, so I think it would be a very real um, advantage for the city. It would be something to talk about. It would be something to celebrate. It could certainly become a real positive um, center for all of winston Salem to, to realize the impact that African Americans had in this community. It's the only early African American neighborhood that we have left in this community. And this is a community that had a remarkable African American uh, uh, population really early on from the, from the 1870s. And, um, and it had the architecture and the, and the neighborhoods to show it, and they're gone. And Reynolds Town is the only one that, that still can show that. When we married, we decided we wanted to build somewhere. We came down here and bought that lot over there on Fair. In fact, we were looking at two or three lots. But I don't know, this is a neighborhood that was so nice and so clean. Now we decided to stay here. We, we came to stay a short while, but we've been here almost 50 <laughs> years. So you see, it must have been all right. It was a, an ideal area. And people were striving to improve their conditions here. Uh, and it was really a... I, I, I love being here. It's just a, just a nice place to live. And the people who've lived here in this community will tell you the same thing. It's a nice place to live. I love it. Well, this is my neighborhood, and, and it's a nice neighborhood. And the people in the ice, I, I love it. That's what makes me <laughs> crazy about it. I would take nothing for it, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Gordon.